My name is Jim Kuka. I'm president of the Chicago Astronomical Society. Welcome to our um, October general meeting. Our um, speaker tonight is uh, Mark Hammergren. Um, the title of his uh, presentation is Meteorites Through Space and Time. Uh, Mark um, worked as a planetary scientist at the Adler Planetarium for, from 2001 through 2020. Uh, his research focuses on investigating the composition of asteroids using reflective spectroscopy, um, a technique that measures mineralogical absorption signatures in the spectra of reflected sunlight from asteroids. Um, Mark is currently president and CEO of his own um, uh, a company called Farther Horizons. And um, we um, welcome Mark and um, Mark, if you can just take it away and uh, educate us. Thank you. Well, I think Mark might be frozen for a second here. Okay. He's frozen in time. Okay. okay. Just, yeah. There we go. Okay, that's much yeah. better. Uh, yeah. Before we do get started, I am going to just quickly uh, mute everyone. I'll ask Mark to unmute yourself um, sure. once that's done. <laughs> then uh, while the while the presentation is going on, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and then I will enable unmuting once the presentation is over and we can have time for questions right afterwards. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Jim. And I'm very happy to be Sorry, Mark, I accidentally muted you as well. <laughs> and again, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here tonight. And uh, this has been an exciting week for asteroid related news. We had the touchdown and sample retrieval from asteroid Bennu, near Earth asteroid Bennu by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. I will briefly mention that later on and we can talk about that after the talk. Uh, but without further ado, I think I'll get started with the presentation here. Well, I'm going to share my screen. And bear with me for one minute. So my talk tonight is really going to be a very personal story. It's going to, well, start in my childhood and go forward through time and explain why I'm interested in these uh, flashing lights in the sky and stones that, that fall to the ground occasionally from them. My childhood inspirations, some of them, and you might recognize them. Yukon Cornelius from uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He's a uh, prospector up north. So I was interested in rocks like most kids are. Flying saucers, here we have Earth versus the flying saucers. Very interested in UFOs and flying saucers as a kid, the possibilities of alien life. Carl Sagan, one of the world's greatest science communicators, uh, was a great influence on, on me in high school, in particular, when Cosmos came out. <laughs> and Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> this, uh, I, I was also very interested in archaeology and, uh, to be honest, treasure hunting. <laughs> so I, I really found something, I think, that combines all of these interests, and I remain interested in them today. Now, you might remember some of these images from the 1953 George Pal movie, War of the Worlds. It starts out with these giant meteors coming down. This is, of course, based on the H.G. Wells novel. Some wonderful, iconic alien invaders. Less iconic alien invaders are the meteorite uh, that hit Gilligan's Island and imbued the residents with special powers. Now, as fanciful as those are, these are based on real phenomenon <laughs> to some degree. And they can be very beautiful and considered art pieces in their own right. This is an iron meteorite, a, a chunk of iron, mostly iron, some nickel, that fell in 1947 in the Siberian forests, knocked down a swath of forest. The 
meteorites. You might know it better as the meteor crater. By the way, let me let me know if I'm I'm breaking up here. I, I don't have my chat window pulled up. But again, you see this beautifully sculpted exterior. This piece in particular weighs over a thousand pounds and is not affixed to the tabletop. If you ever visit the Adler, uh, I, I used to tell kids that if they could pick it up, they could take it home. Um, but uh, I stopped doing that because you'd get a group of them gathering around it and try to shift it around. And I was afraid they would pinch their uh, fingers. And historical interests too. This is the Willamette meteorite. It's an iron meteorite that was uh, found, well, I would say found um, uh, in, uh, in Oregon. It was known by the local Native Americans for ages and ages, and they collected rainwater out of the pockets and used that in uh, ceremonial, uh, for ceremonial purposes. Now, of course, when Westerners found it, they uh, uh, sold it to the American Museum of Natural History in New York and dragged it back there where it was on display. And for a long time, people could climb in it. More locally, and this, this uh, really piqued my interest. Back in 1928, a meteorite fell in Southern Illinois, not too far from St. Louis, the small town of Benald. And that uh, uh, was interesting to me. Here we see uh, poor Mr. McCain, who's uh, brand new 1928 Pontiac Coupe was struck by a meteorite. And if you look closely, it, he looks like it was a very sad face. Back then, there was not the same degree of collecting of meteorites as I saw when I visited the Field Museum as a kid is the very same exhibit that you see there today about this meteorite, the meteorite. And it really, no pun intended, struck me as being fantastic that space could reach out and here on Earth. And so they have various fragments or, or various uh, artifacts of this meteorite fall on Earth. Let's study meteorites in more detail. And just a very quick introduction to meteorites. Meteorites, of course, are rocks that fall from space. Um, the very most common kind are these kinds called ordinary chondrites. They make up more than 70% of all meteorites that fall to the Earth. They're ordinary for that reason. They're not ordinary in the sense of ordinary earth rocks, uh, but they're the most common kind. They're mostly made of silicate minerals and throughout with nickel iron fragments. And what uh, gives its name the chondrites is they have these little glassy beads throughout the interior. And you can see some poking out in the exterior of many called chondrules. And when I say glassy, these are the results of melting of interplanetary dust during the formation of the solar system. These are among the oldest things in our solar system. And in a sense, meteorites are sedimentary rocks collected together in the vacuum of space. Another kind of uh, chondritic meteorite has chondrules that you can see in this image uh, as little, in it. it's, this is a cut through the side of it. You can see little white circles. Chondrites are particularly interesting because they were not heated very much during the formation of these meteorites and their parent asteroids. And that means that the Meteorites is made of clay-like minerals, which is the result of silicate minerals being altered by water. And so some of these can contain up to 20% of their mass in the form of water. They also contain organic material that is not necessarily formed by life, but containing organic molecules, things containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, even complex ones like amino acids. And it's thought that carbonaceous chondrites would have supplied the early Earth with some of its water that we find on its surface, as well as the organic material needed to be the building blocks of life. Iron meteorites can be some of the more interesting looking ones, and I think some of the more interesting kinds, because 
think about where we would find a huge mass of iron on Earth. And you might think iron mines, that kind of thing, but that's not native metal iron. This kind of nickel iron we would find in the core of the Earth. And indeed, most of these iron meteorites would have been formed in the cores of large asteroids, large enough that they would have been completely molten and had the, the heavy metals sink to the core and the lighter molten rocks, the lava, float to the surface. Now, how do we get iron meteorites out of the cores of asteroids? You smash them together. Asteroids have been smashing each other to dust since the formation of the solar system. You cut iron meteorites open, you polish them, you etch them with acids, and you can see these distinctive crystal patterns. Metallurgists do this on Earth to study the, uh, well, the metallurgy of human-made iron. The crystals formed. The crystals in iron meteorites are so big that it means, I might be stuck here, the crystals in iron meteorites are so big that they in indicate a cooling rate of something like one degree every million years or so. Stony iron meteorites are uh, also very interesting. They can be the most beautiful samples of them. They consist of a matrix of this nickel iron with rounded crystals of olivine, known as, um, also known here on Earth as uh, the semi-precious gemstone peridot. Uh, and if you slice these very thin, you can see through the crystals. So often these are displayed backlit by light so that you can see the, the transparent crystals. Okay. Here we come to a formative event for me when I was early in graduate school, this is the second year of my uh, stay in graduate school, the Peekskill meteor was seen flying across the northeastern United States. A very long trajectory, came in at a very shallow angle. Here we see the meteor itself breaking up, came in on a Friday night during homecoming football season. So actually not the, boy, just, uh, just around this time in, in uh, 1992. So many people caught it on video cameras because they were out there filming the, the football games. That enabled scientists to track it back into space and get an orbit for it. But also, it's special because it ended up coming down in Peekskill, New York. Meteorites are named after where they, where they fall. You've frozen up a bit, Mark. Okay. So it uh, it fell through her Chevy Malibu. And uh, I, I later saw this car and the meteorite itself in a glass case in Paris, France uh, uh, during an international ast astronomy conference. So it uh, is definitely, and it remains, I'm sure, the most valuable 1980 Chevy Malibu in existence. During my time at the Adler Planetarium, a very, very interesting event was the fall of the Park Forest meteorite, March 26, 2003. March 26th as a date is important to me nowadays because my son was born March 26, 2016, 13 years later on that same date. But here we see a view of the incoming meteor. It was probably about two meters across, so about six feet across. And this view is from about 100 miles away from South Haven, Michigan. And it came down in the south suburbs of Chicago. And one of the places that was hit, because this is a populated area and fragments of these meteorites came down all over the place. One hit a fire station, other houses were hit, but this one <laughs> hit the house of Phil and Brenda Jones in Olympia Fields, punched through the roof into the dining room, bounced off the dining room wall, punched through the dining room floor, went in the basement, bounced off of a rubber mat, and landed in a pile of lawn. Chemical Society connection, the, the biggest police. I'm sorry, Mark, but you are breaking up. To the Adler Planetarium. 
Okay, I'll, I'll repeat. Uh, the biggest piece uh, was donated by Audrey and Greg Fisher to the Adler Planetarium. And there on the right-hand side, you can see a little bit of the linoleum floor that was uh, embedded onto the meteorite when the, uh, when the meteorite hit the floor. We now know for a variety of reasons that most meteorites come from asteroids. Um, a handful of meteorites, relative handful, fewer than 30 nowadays, have been uh, actually recovered and tracked during their passage to find out what their orbits were. Every single one of them takes their, their way back, if you track them back in time, into the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, a very few of them, a very small fraction, have been identified as pieces of the Moon or Mars, but the vast majority come from asteroids. A little bit about asteroids. Most between uh, orbit between Mars and Jupiter in the so-called main asteroid belt. More than a million asteroids have been discovered to date. Uh, most of them very recently, since the advent of the digital revolution. The largest of these asteroids is asteroid number one, the first one discovered, Ceres, which is about a thousand kilometers or about 600 miles across. And we don't know what the smallest ones are because they're too small for us to find, but they probably, we know for a fact actually, they go all the way to the size of dust grains. And there are probably more than 1.4 million asteroids in the main asteroid belt, larger than about a kilometer. Interesting for a few reasons are those that do not orbit in the main belt, but whose orbits bring them close to Earth, and in some cases, in some cases actually hit the Earth. And more than 24,000 of these near-Earth asteroids or near-Earth objects have been discovered to date. Not all of them, the vast majority are not hazardous. Only the ones larger than about 100 meters across are big enough to punch all the way down through the atmosphere and pose great danger to the surface. A couple pictures of asteroids. Asteroid Bennu, small near-Earth asteroid, a little bit larger than the Empire State Building across, and of course, much more massive. Uh, this was and is the target of the OSIRIS-REx uh, NASA mission, which touched down briefly on the surface of this asteroid and did a and go sample retrieval. And they, I just heard uh, a little while uh, ago from Wayne that they recovered something like two and a half kilograms of material, which, uh, some of it which was composed of larger fragments that they intended, which is kind of jamming open the sample container. So they're gonna try to close that up and, and make sure they can bring that stuff back. It is a sample return mission. Another sample return mission of the asteroid Gu was by the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission. And it sampled the asteroid last year, 2019, and it is actually on its way back to Earth and should return to us in December. So that'll be very interesting to see the materials from these two asteroids. Now, part of this talk is going to be about meteorites and history and mythology. One of the more in, uh, recent pieces, by recent I mean uh, in the Middle Ages, is this uh, really funny thing, I think. Uh, people in Braunschweig, Germany, uh, in the Middle Ages, they believed that bright meteors were dragons flying through the air. And if they stood under the eaves of their house, and yelled out, fire dragon, share with me. The dragon would drop stuff like treasure or a big ham or uh, for the unfortunate, a big pile of excrement. So that explains why they would be standing under the eaves of their house. You don't wanna get hit by any of those things. A little more uh, previous to that, actually for thousands of years, an example uh, of uh, human interest in meteorites is the Cape York meteorite recovered from Greenland. Recovered, again, that's a kind of a generous term. Uh, Robert Peary, the explorer, uh, was led to the meteorites by a local Inuit. And the locals there had been using these iron meteorites, hacking off pieces and using them as native pieces of iron 
to make things like harpoon points. So they were actively using them in their culture to make tools. Because humans, oh, well, think of it. First of all, in Greenland, what are the local sources of iron? None. And uh, also smelting of iron by humans out of iron ore was not discovered, was not developed until something like 2000 BC, ushering in the Iron Age. So for most of human history, metallic iron, the only source of that was iron meteor. that contained pieces made from meteoritic iron, including the iron this iron dagger from the tomb of Tutankhamun. And if you look at even the linguistics, you see a connection. This is the set of hieroglyphs for the Egyptian word ba and pet. Ba and pet means metal from heaven. That's, that's the word for iron, metal from heaven. It's entirely possible, I think, of course it's not recorded, and it's entirely possible that a meteorite fall was observed by people who then recovered iron fragments from that and made that connection. Now the ancient Babel, Babylonian word uh, really meant about the same thing. So this was spread throughout the region. Now this is going to be a little bit more speculative here. The ancient Egyptian Benben stone, that's uh, the pyramidal capstone. So a pyramid shaped capstone to the, uh, to the pyramids. This, in some cases, these would be made of solid gold. The ones that survive today are made of polished stone. And they were believed to represent the rays, you know, rays coming down from the sun or specifically the seed of the sun god in stone form, the petrified version of these things. And it's speculated. Of course, we, we you don't have any firsthand reports dating back from then, that this may have been inspired by oriented meteorites. Oriented meteorites retained their orientation, as the name suggests, as they fall through the atmosphere, which gives them this kind of pyramid-shaped or conical shape like a heat shield shaped form. And it's thought that you, you can think about that bright ray coming out of the sky, even in the daytime, if you have a bright enough meteor. And then when it lands, you see this chunk of rock petrified. What is this? And the connection between the sun god and meteorites is apparent, well, uh, it's, it's thought that maybe the extension of the Benben stone inspired the shape of, of the pyramids themselves. But I was going to say that the most influential story in Egyptian mythology is their creation myth. The creation of the world through the pregnancy of Isis by her brother Osiris. And it's uh, the coffin spell 148, uh, one of these inscriptions. After the blast of a meteorite, such that even the gods fear, Isis awoke pregnant by the seed of her brother Osiris. So we have, and uh, I don't know if you can you can see, but there's an alligator in the top line there, and that word there, yeah, right in the middle of the, the top line of hieroglyphs, and that little alligator-shaped uh, determinative. That's part of the word for meteorite. Imagine an alligator snapping forward, the swift motions of an alligator. Other cultures, dating back even before the Egyptians, worshipped stones that they believed to have fallen from the heavens. And this was put, uh, put forward, brought forward by the ancient Greeks, the ancient Hebrews, people through the Near East, and even the from all of the lands that they conquered. They tried to collect all of the holy items. This is uh, reminiscent of... Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, these expeditions going out to retrieve these things. And on some of the uh, ancient Roman coins, you can see evidence of uh, the temples that were uh, dedicated to the worship of these conical stones, conical stones that were called Betali or Betalus. 
And there are a number of different coins that show that. Here's, here's another temple, uh, the Temple of Adonis at Byblos, showing one of those conical stones in there. Again, possibly oriented meteorites. Now the ancient Greek Betelos, uh, in the ancient Greek is the aniconic, which means not representative, uh, not looking like a representative of a human, uh, to be actually a god itself or the residence of a god. Now that's kind of weird. Why would a why would a, a funny shaped rock be thought to be the residence or or a god itself? Um, maybe if they saw it fall from the sky, or if it looked like something that fell from the sky. And we even see a reference in the Bible uh, in the Old Testament, Genesis 28, Jacob's ladder. Now I, I don't know if you know that story, but he's he's out in the desert and he lays his head down on a stone and he has this vision of angels going up and down a ladder in the heavens and when he wakes up he says among other things and this stone which i, I have set up for a pillar shall be god's house and this is the origin of that later greek term betelos uh, the house of god in in israel in, in i'm sorry in hebrew is beth el so imagine a, a corruption of that term into ancient Greek and then into uh, ancient Latin. So this is from the sky and representing gods or God uh, dates back very early. Later on, uh, the idea of a betel, of a residence of God, was also combined with the idea of what's called an umphalos, uh, a belly button stone, the center of the world, things that included the oracle at Delphi. Here we can see one of these conical shaped stones. In all cases, they were conical shaped stones or more fanciful versions of them. You even see them integrated into uh, later Christian structures, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. There at the very, uh, on the right, at the, uh, towards the bottom, you can see the Omphalos stone in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Meteorites were also revered in the ancient Americas. We know that not necessarily by records, but by evidence. The Casas Grandes meteorite, a large one and a half ton, me uh, ton meteorite, was discovered wrapped up like a mummy in a burial vault. And in Arizona, the Camp Verde meteorite, weighing 135 pounds, was wrapped up in a feather blanket, a very elaborate feather blanket, and put inside a burial chamber, a burial cyst. And you wouldn't do that for ordinary rocks just sitting around there. These were very, very important things to them. And so clearly, there was some special significance associated with these stones. And I think this story, I think, is, is very timely. Again, it's speculative, but very secure. Deals with the Leonid meteor shower. Now, meteor showers, like the Leonids, are not, do not arrive uh, to us from asteroids, but rather comets. They're bits of debris from comets uh, given off during their passage by the sun. And currently, the Leonid meteor shower occurs in the middle of November, 17th, 18th of November, and outbursts maybe your storms can occur roughly every 33 years, not like clockwork necessarily. Sometimes you miss one of these uh, apparitions, but sometimes you get thousands and thousands of meteorite, uh, meteors falling per hour. Just an incredible, incredibly dramatic appearance. To the ancient Aztecs, this was known as the falling hairs. The meteorites were, meteors were the falling hairs, the fall of Tzontemokwa. And this, the, the Leonid meteor showers were supposed to be accompanied by the Lord of the Dead. And this led to the timing of the Aztec festival of the dead when the deceased can visit the living. This might already sound familiar to, to folks. And the timing of this festival and that the meteor shower itself occurred back in the 1500s by the time the Spaniards arrived uh, in late October. Now, not in mid-November because the, of the procession of the equinoxes, the very slow turning of the pole of the earth 
which causes the seasons to vary during the time of the year. And so what happens in late October that is related to the Festival of the Dead? Now, uh, this is disputed by some historians who think that this is just a, a more recent repopularization of the time of, of, of this uh, in the 20th century uh, for Mexican nationalism. But uh, I think that uh, even in that case, it builds off of traditional beliefs that were integrated into Christianity during the, that syncretic period of Spanish occupation. And even more recently, this is a very interesting part of my own personal history, the impact of asteroid 2008 TC3, discovered by my friend Richard Kowalski working at the Catalina Sky Survey. And here we see how asteroids are usually found. You take a series of images of the night sky pointing in some direction where you don't know anything really is, and you look for something that's moving against the background stars. So this asteroid was automatically discovered. Richard confirmed it, made sure, yeah, that's a real thing, measured the positions of it, sent it into the Minor Planet Center, and then got a notification back that it was on a collision course with Earth. Uh, you can imagine the feelings that that would inspire. Actually, the government was notified about that. So the next question is, when is it going to hit? Less than one day notice. Now that was, I, I don't know, I would say it's not very fortunate, but it also implied that given how faint the asteroid was and how close it was to Earth, it was also very small. So probably less than something about five meters, maybe 10 to 15 feet across. Any damage should it hit the Earth would make an awesome fireball. And its position was so well known as it came in that they could predict where it was going to hit within just a few kilometers. And indeed, in the early morning hours of November, I believe it was, or was that October? October 6th, very October 7, very early morning hours, a bright fireball erupted over the skies of Northern Sudan. This is the Nubian desert. And as the sun rose the next morning, people in Wadi Halfa, the border city between Egypt and Sudan, saw this really crazy smoke trail in the sky. This is dust blasted off, ablated off the meteorite as it fell through the sky. And it's twisted into these crazy shapes by changing upper atmospheric winds. Not only was it seen from the ground, but also infrasound, low frequency sound measurements detected it uh, impacting in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, infrared satellites, weather satellites, detected the flash in the sky as it came in. And again, the idea was that you could track its passage through the atmosphere and figure out where it would have fallen on the ground. And indeed, that's, that's what was done. And later that year, an expedition was mounted and fragments of the meteorite, the fragments of this small asteroid were recovered. And here we can see one of the early maps. Red dots show where the fragments were. Nubian desert. And the closest point of any kind of habitation was Station 6, Almahata Sita, which is a train repair station. One year later, a conference was held in Khartoum, Sudan, at the University of Khartoum. And because I was working doing research on asteroids of the very same kind, I was able to travel to Khartoum to attend this conference and present some work I had done on asteroids of that type. 
And here we see many of the local faculty attending one of the sessions. I, I found it very interesting that here in Sudan, uh, more than half of the faculty were women in, in the sciences. And after the academic conference, we took an expedition to the impact site to do our own search for meteorites. So we started out in the capital of Khartoum and we traveled on a road that was paved for about maybe three quarters of the way, a little bit more than that, a journey of about 500 miles. The last hundred of which though, are in the sand sea of the Nubian desert, following along that train line, which connects Khartoum to Egypt. And along the way, we stopped at some historical locations. And this is the mountain, the very small mountain of Jebel Barkal and the Temple of Amun, where you see us walking through right now. The Temple of Amun in ancient Greece, it was the center of what was then a universal religion. It's where the pharaohs of Egypt at that time, up to Ramses II, were coronated. And here we are traipsing through it. And as someone interested in archaeology myself, I was both fascinated and horrified that almost anywhere we walked, there would be kind of a crunching noise. The crunching of us stepping on potsherds, little bits of broken pottery. And everywhere I went, I could pull up things like this, dating back 3,000 years, 4,000 years in some cases just underfoot. Here we see a decorated piece of pottery. Look down and here's a piece of metalwork, ornamental metalwork, just laying there on the ground. Uh, archaeological treasures laying there because they just really don't have the resources to conduct site preservation or uh, further excavations of the site. And of course, <laughs> this being Sudan and these being treasured national, uh, nationally significant items. There's no way I was gonna, you know, pocket any of these things. Oh, well, let me, let me fill up and take these things home because uh, yeah, I'm not gonna end up in a Sudanese prison. These are the vehicles that we use to travel across the sand sea. I, I called them at the time adventure buses. I swear they had almost no suspension. And once we got off the paved roads, I mean, the potholes were bad enough. And you think the sand is going to be relatively smooth, but holy cow, we were bouncing up and down very bad. So for about a hundred miles, I had to stand in the bus, hold onto the back of the seat in front of me and ride it like a bucking Bronco. And we would get stuck sometimes in the sand because a very fine sand, everybody'd have to get out and we would have to push. Well, I was off to the side, not pushing. You can only stack so many people up. And we went into the night. This is one of the Range Rovers accompanying us. And starting out at something like six in the morning, we finally arrived at the site at about 3 a.m., at which point we had to set up our tents. And my tent is the one in blue there to the, uh, to the right. My trusty family tent, which I humped all the way to Sudan in the middle of nowhere. And uh, that building behind us is the single bathroom for this entire site. Uh, all of these buildings were built by the British during the reconquest of Sudan in the, uh, towards the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s. And you can imagine basically a, a, a pit toilet that has been filling up for more than 100 years. Here in the daytime, is our site. And this is the train repair station, refueling station. We went out into the desert and we painstakingly lined up for a systematic search. And there was an attempt almost at military precision, stretching us out so many feet apart. Okay, stretch a little further and then go. So we're standing there around for about a half hour or so. And then go, let's you know do a systematic search. And everybody runs off in different directions. It was, uh, it was a little frustrating that we were wasting so much time. But as we went along, and here you can see the terrain that we're looking through. Some hills in the distance. We don't want to search those places. Other things that we found. Different. 
This was an inhabitable area. We were told that there were entire cities, entire villages up in the mountains nearby. And these have not been excavated. And thankfully, the locals, the few of them that there are in the, the Nubian desert, they don't, they don't touch these things. Ah, here, I found this meteorite. This is my, these meteorites were easy to find because they were, you know, surrounded by these circles in the dirt. You know, you just have to, no, no. Um, once we found one, we weren't supposed to touch it. We were supposed to just circle it and stay by there for the retrieval team to come. One single retrieval team for our entire group of people. And so we'd have to stand there waiting and waiting and waiting for people to show up to pick these things up and take them away. And then we could look for more meteorites. And as you're standing there, off in the distance, you see, oh, there's another meteorite. Okay, I gotta wait now again. Again, easy to find because this one fell next to a dollar bill. No, um, for scale, very easy to spot these black stones in places among the white marbleish sand. Another close-up of these things here, you see some of the hallmarks of what is still a relatively freshly fallen meteorite, the kind of matte black fusion crust and a slightly different colored interior. These meteorites had been identified as being a very rare type called a Uriolite, named after Uri, uh, a location in Russia. A differentiated type meteorite. They're again, made by processes that completely melted the meteorite uh, of the parent asteroid. And these ones, uh, the Uriolite meteorites, contain a substantial fraction of their composition in the form of tiny, tiny micro diamonds. This one, I think, is very cute. It's about the size of a pea, the sand grains next to it. So we found you were able to find things this small and this unweathered because of them falling in a, in a desert during that time. Uh, I was lucky enough to find eight fragments altogether. Our team, uh, the entire team, we found about 40 fragments of different sizes. And so this was uh, a, an incredible experience for me. And so if any of you are familiar with the classic movie, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, but, uh, you know, when, when the prospector finds the gold deposit without even telling his companions, he just goes crazy and starts doing this happy prospector dance. And, uh, you know, I used to be, I still am in rock hounding, and every time I find something really cool or if I find some gold specks in a river, I have to do the happy prospector dance. So I find my meteorite and I have to stand there and I have to do the happy prospector dance. And uh, let me tell you, it was an incredible experience. And here we come to the end. This is my friend Richard Kowal from the Catalina Sky Survey. Uh, he is still very much active as an observer at that program. And he is also notable, not only as the discoverer of asteroid TC3, but also the second and the third known asteroid to hit the Earth, all of them very small. Uh, so right to Earth, and one of them ugh, fell in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the other one in, in southern uh, South Africa. So um, I will leave it there and open up for questions. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, there have not been any questions in the uh, chat just yet, um, although Bob Kaplow does say that that meteorite at the Adler is his uh, because he has a picture from when he was 10 years old in 1964 of him touching that meteorite. Um, and so, Bob, if you do have that picture and want to share it, uh, please feel free to do so. <laughs> the rest of the participants, you are free to unmute yourselves if you have questions or you can drop them in the chat and I will relay them to Mark as well. This, this is Bob. Actually, I think Mark helped me get that picture. I've got that old Viewmaster reel, and I contact. I think I met Mark at some Adler presentation somewhere. He put me in touch with Adler's archivist, and they digitized those pictures and sent me a CD. So I'm going to click on Share here for a moment, and you can tell. Are, are you seeing that now? 
So you can tell yes. that's a view master reel. Do, do you see my mouse moving in the picture too? Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. So you, it's a square picture and it's got those rounded corners. Fantastic. So that, that's, I, I don't know if Mark goes back far enough. Uh, before all the Adler expansions, that was down in the basement under the, the dome room. And right. they had the cutaway image of the crater sitting there. Wow. And they yeah. sat me under those floodlights for about an hour getting that picture wearing my winter coat indoors. <laughs> oh, boy. And you remember you, that. You know what the rule is when you're 10 years old, if your hand is on something, right? If you touch it, it's yours, right? Oh. So I maintain still that that's my meteorite on display there. Uh, we do have a couple of other questions in the chat um, for Mark. The first one is from Alan. Uh, there's a Chicago store that is advertising meteorite jewelry that is carbon dated to something billion years. Uh, perhaps they pick something that the public would get instead of saying usable dating methods. Is that common? You've heard of something like that before? Car carbon dating, carbon dating specifically is not usable on meteorites. Carbon dating uh, relies on uh, the proportion of carbon-14 isotope relative to carbon-12. And it's a radioactive isotope generated here on the Earth by the impact of cosmic rays, just uh, radiation impinging on the Earth. And that decays on a relatively short time scale, relatively geologically speaking, thousands of years time scale. So you cannot date something billions of years ago by carbon dating but you can use other radioactive isotopes. Um, uh, thorium, um, lead, uranium, uh, these kinds of isotopes have uh, billions of years, in some cases, uh, uh, decay times. So you can use those to date those meteorites. Oh, yeah. That is probably what they're confusing on. And then also Tracy asks, um, are there any precautions that you should take when dealing with physical specimens? Precautions. So um, that works both ways. If you're talking about being worried about health, um, no meteorites are radioactive. They're not made of poisonous materials. Um, there's the, really the greatest threat from a meteorite is. Uh, oh, you froze up a little bit here, Mark. Really? Okay. Sorry, you froze up right when you said that your greatest threat from meteorite okay. is. And <laughs> your then greatest you threat is dropping it on your foot, dropping it on your toe. If it's big enough. If it's big enough, that's right. I've got I've got a bunch of tiny ones too. In which case, your biggest threat is dropping it on the floor and not being able to find it again. Now, <laughs> the other way of looking at it is um, what should you do to preserve meteorites? A chunk of rock like this that is covered with a patina from the desert is not gonna be terribly affected by my handling it. But if you have a fresh meteorite or a, you know, a nice polished iron meteorite, your skin oils can impart things like salts and moisture, which will cause rust and will corrode meteorites over time. Okay. Oh, and also one other thing, uh, the iron meteorites, they do contain a few percent nickel and some people are allergic to nickel. And there are jewelry tests that of nickel. And some people use them to try to figure out if something's a meteorite or not. So that's the only, that's the biggest problem. Uh, kind of related to that and from my own curiosity, um, when you were talking about your experience in the desert, um, you had to draw the circle in the stand and wait for someone to come over uh, because you weren't allowed to touch them. Uh, right. And the reason I was just curious what the reasoning behind that was is that just so that right. you don't put it in your pocket and walk away with it or something? No, like not, that? not so much. Not so much. You know, uh, uh, the idea was that I don't know if I'm freezing up here again, but the idea was that uh, we wanted to preserve the chemical integrity of the meteorites. We don't want to touch them and import impart anything like organic molecules from our skin, any oils that kind of thing, so that these would be as pristine as we can, we can get them. Now, that was something of a crock, though, I have to say, because after taking such long precautions uh, and wasting so much time, honestly, we get back to Khartoum, and the Sudanese leader of the expedition 
uh, he's carting these things around in plastic. Okay, they're wrapped up in foil, but loosely wrapped. And then in plastic shopping bags in the back, in the trunk of his car, which is stinking of gasoline fumes. And not only that, but when he has these in the lab, he decided it was very important to measure their densities. And that's a marginally interesting property of a meteorite. Um, but instead of packing, so how do you measure the, the density? You measure the mass and then you measure the volume. So the density is the mass divided by the volume of it. How do you measure the volume? Well, you're not gonna put it in water to see how much it displaces. Most places who do this, they put the meteorite in a container of tiny glass spheres, tiny glass spherules, and you measure the volume displacement there. He didn't wanna do that though. So he just had people sweep up his lab floor and the hallway and collect all of that dust and dirt and put it in beakers and drop the meteorites in there and cover it up. And there was an active, uh, they, they were actively painting always. So, um, you know, talking about organic materials, organic compounds in these meteorites, it was just a, you know, after all of our precautions, uh, I would not trust any data coming uh, out from those studies. So yeah, we had a had another question, I think, pop up. Yes, uh, from Alan. Um, he said, uh, and the meteorites big enough to hurt us um, and projected impact dates uh, for that. And so I'm going to paraphrase a little bit off of that um, relating to what you had said um, from your friend who found the asteroid with the one day notice projected impact date, um, it being relatively small, um, kind of going off Alan's question here, are what is the danger of a, you know, uh, one that can actually physically cause harm to a person or a structure uh, and we don't know about it or uh, we find it, you know, with a day's notice or something like that. Right, right. Well, we, we had a very, uh, a very notable example of that several years ago over Russia, over the uh, Western Siberia city of Chelyabinsk, uh, a, a meteorite, a chunk of rock, ordinary chondrite as a matter of fact, uh, somewhere around 50 feet across, 50, 55 feet across, uh, came in at, at a very shallow angle, and it broke up into thousands and thousands of fragments, millions of fragments, really, the largest of which was a few feet across, fell in a small lake. And no damage was caused on the ground by any of those fragments hitting anything, but, but rather the atmospheric shock wave, the, the blast of air from that meteorite coming down. Um, and blasting through the air at hypersonic speeds caused tremendous damage in the area, mostly in the form of shattered windows. But uh, more than 1,600 people were sent to the hospital with injuries, mostly from broken glass. Um, and uh, also people hurting themselves as they hurled themselves away from the, from the blast coming in. Um, uh, oh, I think we lost you again. For just Rose. a second here. And, oh, okay. okay, you seem to be back now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so that was about, again, about 55 feet across. Air blast uh, will be the major source of damage up to things that are about maybe 100 feet across. Uh, Majid asks a follow up question. Um, could be how long in advance do we usually learn about these meteorite impacts? So there are vastly more small ones than big ones, which means that most of the ones that are discovered in general are very small, anywhere from maybe only a few meters across to maybe tens to a hundred meters across. And these are discovered with, at, in most cases, only a few weeks notice. In every case where one has been discovered prior to impact, it's been within a few days of impact, with, uh, if not a couple hours of impact. Um, larger asteroids, uh, their orbits can be known for, in, in the best, most exquisite cases, up to a thousand years in advance. We can track them and determine whether they might hit or not. But after about a hundred years or so, going forward into the future, um, the orbits are chaotic enough that we cannot determine whether an impact will, will occur or not. No definitive impacts are known to be 
uh, on the on the radar screen for a long time coming. Well, uh, forever. We don't know of any. Okay, and uh, John asks if you would elaborate on the process of determining the direction of origin of meteors, uh, especially considering that different sized objects may encounter different amounts of atmospheric resistance. Uh, so do you take that into account when you determine their direction? Uh, yes, absolutely, to some extent, Al although the atmospheric resistance isn't as important as you might think. And that's because when we see, uh, when you first see a meteor entering the atmosphere, in almost all cases, that's at altitudes of about 100 kilometers or about 60 miles high. And so much of the path, the early path of a meteor in the sky is relatively unaffected by the Earth's atmosphere. You do see that drag later on, especially when fragmentation occurs. But uh, when you see that early path, you can really just follow it through the sky. You have to have at least three different points of view to triangulate where it is at a given time. But then you can, you know, as you watch it come down, you can track it backwards in time. A bigger effect than atmospheric drag is the gravity of the Earth. So you have to do what they call propagating the position of that. You have to include the effects of gravity as it had pulled it on the way in. Then you can track it out into space and take into account things like the, well, the, the gravities of the sun and the other planets and the moon. Wonderful. Uh, John says, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Hammergren? <clears throat> well, it's been wonderful to talk to you tonight. Yes, thank you I, so much. I'm to hang around for a couple minutes as long as you are, Wayne. Uh, uh, sure. We. I don't really have too much else. I don't know, Mr. Kuka, if you have anything you wanted to add. Um, I am more than happy to stick around uh, for as long as you would like uh, for questions and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's entirely up to you. Um, yeah, this is Jim. Um, uh, hello, Guillermo. Um, <laughs> um, haven't uh, talked to you for a while. Um, <clears throat> we hope to have a, um, a Zoom meeting uh, in November. We don't have a speaker a date set up, but please stay tuned um, and we'll, um, once we get a speaker lined up, we'll uh, send out the word. We'll have it posted to our website and we'll have it put it on Facebook. And, uh, and of course, uh, Cernan will do the same. So uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to Mark Hammergren and uh, to everybody who uh, participated. Thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Thank you.